What is up, Stacking Ohana? This is Aloha Stacker, and welcome back to the channel and another video. And in this video today, we're going to be talking about the history of the United States trade dollar. But before we start talking about the history of the trade dollar, I want to show off one quick piece of channel mail that I got that I think you guys are really going to enjoy because it is really cool. So it is from none other than our good friend, the expat stacker. Check that out. Look at those awesome stickers. They are huge. Ooh. <laughs> so let me go ahead and set those here for the time being. So you can check out our good friend, Mr. Expat Stacker. Now he sent me a nice letter in the mail and this is what it says. He says, Aloha. First and foremost, congratulations on your retirement from the United States Navy. Thank you for over two decades of service to our nation. I sincerely appreciate that. Thank you for trading with me and for your patience with me while I get my end of it fulfilled. This is my first silver trade and i love that morgan you sent really great yeah i sent him a 1921 morgan silver dollar to korea so that was pretty cool and he already showed that off in his video so uh, i'll put a link in the description to his channel so if you can check out that video i also love your channel brother so much interesting stuff and your passion passion and diligence for this makes it very enjoyable i really like history mondays and i think you can use the round i sent to you to do an episode of history mondays because there's a lot of history that ties in with the places that's on that round i'd be happy to help you out with the research on it if you're interested i don't have as much swag as you but i threw in my sticker korean snacks well i didn't get the korean snacks because unfortunately they wouldn't hawaii wouldn't let them send them to me and some other stuff to hopefully help make up for the amount of time it took me to get this sent out I hope you enjoy what I have sent to you, my friend. Thanks again for all your effort. You are an impactful and great part of the stacking community, and I'm sure they feel your presence even when you join the Euro stackers. Be safe. Much love and respect. Catch you on the flip side, expat stacker. So that is a beautiful note from my friend, expat stacker. He sent me that really cool, uh, some really cool stickers. He also sent me this. Check this out, everyone. I think this is really cool. He sent me this Grand Stacker of Excellence on the nomination of Chancellor of the Grand Stackers Alliance has conferred upon Aloha Stacker the degree in Grand Stacker of Excellence from Expat Stacker, who's the Chancellor of the Grand Stackers Alliance, dated 328-2021, with a serial number and all. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Uh, what a cool, what a really cool gift. <laughs> what a really cool gift from Expat Stacker. But if you think that's it, that is not it. He talked about a coin, something that he sent me. That we, he said I, you can help me do a History Mondays on it. Well, I'm going to show it off today, uh, and then maybe we can talk about it on a History Monday segment. Right now, I have enough history uh, segments lined up for uh, the rest of the month for the time being. So until I get through all those, maybe we can catch this one back on the flip side later on. You like that, expat? <laughs> and this is what he sent me. He sent me something from the Korean Gold Exchange. Now, before you get all crazy and think it's gold, it's not. <laughs> but it, we see this is, is what it says here. It says 1544993, Korean Gold Exchange. Lots of Korean writing there. I have no idea what any of that says. And then he sent me this right here. So let's take this out. Now on the back side, now the box just is, it's a pretty neat case. I mean, look, look how it opens. It's, it's really neat. I don't have anything else that comes out of a box like this, so that's pretty cool. But here's, here, here's what he sent me right here. Let's go ahead and zoom. So there's the coin. It says Dokdu, beautiful island of Korea, four nines fine silver, one ounce fine silver. And on this side, it says natural monument number 336, Korea gold exchange. It comes in this really cool uh, plastic protector. Shows that it's one ounce of silver. I've never seen anything like this. I don't know how many were minted. I don't know anything about it. And I can't wait to uh, uh, get with expat and he can help me out because look at those islands. I'm guessing it's that's the, the national monument. Are these beautiful two islands or group of islands? I guess two major islands, and they look really pretty. But this is a really cool piece of silver. It's a one ounce coin, and uh, I had never seen like this anything like this in the United States before. And I don't know if any of you have either. If you have, let me know. But this is something very unique and probably only available in the in the nation of South Korea. And uh, well, I think it's really cool. So thank you very much, my friend. I really appreciate it. This is so cool. Uh, and I will cherish this always in my collection. And if I get a chance, uh, we will make this a History Monday segment and we'll talk about the history a little bit. That's cool because I love Korea. I did. I took a whole class on the history of Korea in college. So I would love to uh, do nothing more than talk about Korea. Hopefully, uh, hopefully the uh, if, you, if you're all interested in that, go ahead and hit me up in the, in the comments and say, yeah, let's, let's talk about Korea a little bit because I'm cool with that. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom back out and we'll go ahead and remove these stickers out of the way so that we can talk about what we're here for today. And now we're on the History Monday segment. So we're going to talk about the history of the trade dollar. But before we jump into the history of the trade dollar, of course, I just wanted to show you some of these old Spanish coins because before the U.S. had a trade dollar, this is pretty much what was used. First, we had the pillar dollars. 
This is my 1739, if you've seen in other videos. Beautiful. This is a shipwreck coin, but still it is a pillar dollar from 1739. So this is an early one from Philip V, who was the king of Spain at the time. Then we have this, this one from 1786 with Carlos III. This was my very first pieces of eight that I owned. So this is another beauty. So as we move up into the years, the next one, and this one's this one's key to this to this uh, video specifically. This is the 1796, and this one is Carlos the Fourth. But this one, as you can see, is chop marked. And I did a whole video on chop marks if you remember, talking about how they dealt with the Asian trade, and that is really cool. So we will talk much more about that because the trade dollar I have is loaded with chop marks, and I can't wait to show you all. But here it is. Look at that. Look at those cool. Look at those cool designs right there. So cool. Love it. So that's 1796. Moving on, we have the next, uh, is 1816, and this is Ferdinand the Seventh. Another beautiful one, and this one's cool because this one, I like this one a lot because this one is from the Potosi Mint. See the mint mark right there? There is the mint mark right there from Potosi. So that's cool. So that's my only one that's not from the Mexico City Mint. So that's really cool. And then there's a Dos Real, and this two Reals from 1830, another Ferdinand the Seventh. And this one is actually manufactured. This one's actually from Spain itself. This one is made in Seville or Sevilla. So those are all my pieces of eight or two reals or old Spanish uh, Spanish money. Let me go ahead and shift this down so you can see how cool they all are because they are beautiful. Now let's go ahead and show you the trade dollar. Now this is the U.S. trade dollar right here. Now this one is beat up pretty good. It's an 1876. It says in God we trust. There's stars around that, and you got Lady in the Seat of Liberty. And that is with front, but wait till you see this side. This is where the action is at, my friends. This is actually a San Francisco minted. It is listed right underneath here, but it's really hard to see because it got chopped on top right here. It says United States of America. It actually says 420 grains of 90% silver. It says 900, so it says 900 here. It's really, it's very hard to tell, but it's uh, really cool. So check out the chop marks on that, which means this thing has traveled the world. This has spent many a time in the Asian ports doing trade because this thing is a chop marked beast. Look at that, as I turn it, check out the, the cool chops that you can see. Look at it even in the dim, look how nice that is. So this is my first and only trade dollar that I own. And uh, what we're gonna go ahead and do now is we're gonna go ahead and talk about it. And we'll uh, flip it around a few times during the uh, the video. But actually, you know what we'll do? Since we got two chop mark coins, we'll put the chops next to each other and we'll leave. And uh, let's see real quick, let's get this the right way. Let's go ahead and do that. Like that, so that way we can see. I wonder if I can zoom in anymore. Let me check this out. Yeah, that's about the maximum zoomage I can get. So let's move over just a little bit. So we show two chop mark coins, which I love, by the way. There's absolutely beautiful coins. I love the history. So let's talk about the history of the U.S. trade dollar. And so I have an article here written by Kathleen Duncan, and this was in uh, Coin World. And this article was dated May 31st, 2012, and it's called The History of the Trade Dollar. And here we go. Until the 1850s, Americans spent most of their history <clears throat> looking towards the East Coast and Europe. Thereafter, we began to explore the strategic and economic significance of developing the West Coast and maintaining shipping routes from there to the Far East. The problem for the U.S. merchants was that China preferred a higher silver content of the Mexican peso, also called the 8 real. Ceded Liberty dollars were reluctantly accepted at a discount and, more, and most subsequently melted. To compete efficiently, American bankers and merchants often imported pesos, paying a premium of 7.5% over bullion value to acquire them. The concept of a special commercial dollar of greater silver content that would facilitate Asian trade was born from this hurdle. Minted for circulation in, from July 1870, 1873 until April 1878, the trade dollar represents one of the shortest lived of all the United States numismatic series. Across all dates and mint marks, nearly 36 million were produced. However, due to heavy circulation within Asian markets, frequent counter stamping with Chinese characters or chop marks, merchant and Asian stamped Merchants in Asia stamped the dollars with Chinese characters to attest to their weight and fineness, allowing them to be confidently accepted at face value, and melting nearly every issue is elusive in MS-65 and finer conditions. Proofs, with the exception of the later proofs-only issues, are also rare in gem and better. Besides its commonly known purpose as a United States coin to compete with the Mexican dollar, the trade dollar has a, had a lesser known but equally imperative role 
the politically important mining interests needed for the new outlet for the huge supply of silver glutting the world market. In the years during and after the Civil War, the Comstock Lode and other western mines were producing large quantities of silver. For a time, miners found outlets in foreign markets. Canada, Latin America, and Europe all absorbed significant quantities during the 1860s. But after the Prussian Chancellor Otto von Bismarck united Germany in 1871 and subsequently placed it on a gold standard, the silver was dumped onto the international market. As supplies escalated, prices plummeted. Under a long-standing law, silver could be deposited with the U.S. Mint for conversion into silver coins, for which it would then be exchanged. Miners invariably chose silver dollars, the one denomination that hadn't been changed when all other silver coins experienced a reduction in weight in 1853. As a result, silver dollar mintages soared above the 1 million mark in 1871 and 1872. The Coinage Act of 1873, a.k.a. the Crime of 73, put a stop to this by suspending production of silver dollars. Mining interests were placated by the approval of the new trade dollar that would provide an outlet for their metal and hopefully open it up to new Asian channels. In addition to providing a green light for the trade dollar, the Act of February 12, 1873 abolished the two-cent piece, the three-cent silver, the half-dime, and the seeded dollar. Due to the declining price in silver, weights were again reduced on the dime, quarter, and half dollar as they had been 20 years prior. A rider on the bill made trade dollars legal tender, but only up to five dollars. In other words, no more than five could be spent at one time, as they weren't intended for to circulate in the States. This must not have been considered a potential problem at the time, but would soon prove to be. At the time, the bullion value of the trade dollar was averaged at a dollar and two cents. During the first two years of production, the vast majority of trade dollars were shipped to the Orient. In 1875 and early 1876, more were used in the States. A further decline in the price of silver in 1876 caused millions of trade dollars to return to the U.S. from China, leading Congress to demonetize the issue entirely. This was the first and only time the U.S. government revoked the legal tender status of any of our nation's coinage. After 1876, trade dollars could not, be legally, could not legally be spent at face value. Their value fluctuated in the metal market. Although coinage was intended solely for export to the Orient, gener generous numbers eventually found their way into domestic commerce. In 1877, Secretary of the Treasury John Sherman directed that silver deposited for coinage into trade dollars would only be paid upon evidence that it would be exported. Evidence, sadly, was, in the same instances, fabricated. Profiteers sold some of these commercial dollars to unscrupulous employers who paid them, who paid their workers, who paid them to their workers. One-sixth to one-fifth of these salaries were lost when the coins were redeemed, creating serious public dissent, discontent. This was the beginning of the end, and on February 22, 1878, John Sherman mandated the end of production with his Sherman Silver Act. By this time, the Philadelphia... Philadelphia had produced no business strikes, only proofs. Almost simultaneously, on February 28, 1878, the Bland-Allison Act directed the government to buy vast quantities of silver at subsidized prices to be coined exclusively into Morgan dollars. Proof, do proof trade dollars were issued for an additional five years in mintages that ranged from 960 to 1987. It wasn't until the 1887 that the public was allowed to redeem them again at face value. All told, 35,958,460 trade dollars were produced, 20,327,910 after they were demonetized on July 22, 1876. Of the grand total coined from 1873 to 1878, all were exported except for 6,607,632 pieces. 82% served their intended purpose as items of international commerce, as did this one, as you can tell. The trade dollar's design is widely viewed as an attractive upgrade to the Gobrex Seated Liberty on which it was loosely based. William Barber, Barber's Graceful Liberty is seated on bales of merchandise facing westward. In her right hand, she holds an olive branch, which, which she extends to the west. Here, let me actually you know what while I'm reading that. Let's go ahead and bring that up so you can see it. While ribbon inscribed with liberty appears on the left, the 13 stars of the original colony surrounded with an upper obverse rim and waves representing the Pacific Ocean appear in her background. Now, I know that's really hard to see, of course, because this one is so damaged uh, just from this being struck so much on the back or on the uh, reverse. Let's see where we're at. Okay, the reverse depicts an eagle. All right, let's go ahead and flip this. <laughs> or used to depict an eagle, depicts an eagle with the wings outspread above the coin's prominently displayed weight and fineness, 420 grains, 900 fine. The inscription, United States of America, and trade dollars surrounds. So that's that. there you have it, my friends. This is the United States trade dollar, the only one that I have, but very beautiful. Isn't it? It's got a reeded edge. It's 1876. It's a San Francisco mint. So let me go ahead and put this back in its place, and we'll continue on. So in 1873, 
More than, in, more than any other U.S. design, the trade dollar was a product of Western mints. Although production began in Philadelphia, the largest number of dyes was sent to San Francisco, where the majority of deposits were expected. The local was also favored as the closest mint to the Orient. Trade dollars reached China in October 1873, where they were positively, positively received. Nearly the entire production of 1873 went to that country. Although the first-year examples typically experienced collector hoarding and scantily available in the States at the time of production has made high-grade examples particularly elusive. Even the 19, 1873S was exported nearly in its entirely, and most of the production was melted in either China or India, ensuring few returned back home. It is the rarest of all the San Francisco business strikes. The 1873CC, or Carson City, is one of the top rarities in the series, although both PCGS and NGC record a coin in each in MS-65, no recent trades can be found in auction. The most recent trade for a PCGS MS-64 was $46,000 in January of 2007. 1873 also was the honor of being the rarest issue from the official 11-year proof run from 1873 to 1883. All right, in 1874. In this year, the Philadelphia Mint experienced its highest production until 1877, although survivors in GEM are still obscu obscure. The 1874 CC is the rarest issue in the series in high mint state grades. The last rec recorded auction price realized an NGC MS-65 at $37,375 in September of 2008. Combined population in MS-65 and PCGS and NGC is 5. The, M the 1874S is, the is available in most conditions up to gem. 1874 proofs are exceptionally rare and only slightly more available than 1873 proofs. So 1875, a new reverse hub was put into use. Proof and business strikes exist from both old and new hubs. Type 1 has a, has a berry below the eagle's claw. Type 2 lacks it. The Type 1 is considerably scarcer among the surviving 1875S population, and nearly all mint state examples are known in the type of the, are in the Type 1 or 2 type. The 1875S saw a record production of 4,488,000. 4, the 1875 Philadelphia issue, however, saw a paltry mintage of 218,200, making it the scarcest among all the Philly issues. The 1875S, or CC, is the rarest of the regular issues in the series and only over mint mark. 1876. The 1876, which is this one, by the way was an obverse hub change. The type one is distinguished by the end of the ribbon held by Liberty pointed to the left. The type two obverse has a ribbon pointing down. This is the most plentiful Philly of issue available. It was also the beginning of the widespread use of the trade dollar domestically. Although the San Francisco mint saw record production as well, the 1876 Carson City is the third rare striking in the series. This year also produced a highly popular 1876 uh, Char uh, Carson City double die reverse variety. The reverse showed dramatic doubling on the Eagle's left wing on the right side of the coin. The branches, berries, leaves, and much of the lettering making it one of the strongest and most widely spaced doublings known in any series. Finding one is not easy, however, as many have been graded in any condition, none higher than MS-64. 1877. The 1877S was the highest production in the series, making it relatively common in mint state, particularly at the lower levels. It is also the most common in any circulated grades, including chop mark examples. All are type 2-2, two, 2-2. Two, two like all its Carson City brethren, the 1877 Carson City is scarce in all grades, particularly in mint state. PCGS and NGC each show one MS-65 example, the most recent trading trade being for a PCGS coin that brought in $69,000 in November of 2005. 1878. The 1878S saw the second highest mintage for the series at production of over $4 million. Conversely, no coins were produced all in Philadelphia that year, and the 1878 Carson City has by far the lowest mintage of the series at 97,000 coins. Additionally, a good portion was melted shortly after striking, making the second rarest issue in uncirculated grades. After only the 1875S slash CCO over CC, and PCGS and NGC each have pronounced exactly one, mint, one coin in MS-65. The last trade for an NGC example was selling for $143,750 in January 2007. Wow, $143,750. Do you hear that? For one, for one of those. So in the 1884 and 1885 proofs. So their issues, these issues are two of the most coveted in the entire numismatic kingdom. They were produced secretly at the mint and to provide an interesting anonym to the series. Although there is official record of dyes having been made for 1884, the production is listed either date and no specimens were given to the mint following the normal proof procedures. These issues are generally unknown to the collecting community until John W. Hasseltine announced that he had found the coins in 18, of the 1884 and 1885 proof sets owned by his father-in-law, William Idler's estate. Idler was known to have close ties to the mint personnel. Virgil Brand was the principal buyer after these coins were disclosed. 
Absent official records, it is uncertain how many were produced, but only 10 1884s and 5 1885s are known, both among the most valuable of all numismatic rarities. In November of 2005, the 1884 PCGS PR65 example, the highest grade of the date, sold for $603,750. In November 2004, the 1885 NGC PR62 sold for $1,006,250. The highest recorded grade... For this date is an NGC PR63 Cameo, which may or may not be the coin that sold as the PR62 above. Mintages reigned from a low 97,000 for the 1878 Carson City to a, to a high of more than 9 million for the 1877 San Francisco. The series includes 18 regular issues and 11 proofs, not counting the 1884 and 1885, making it, reason, it a reasonable but not insurmountable challenge for collectors. Its intrinsic design and large size are intrinsically appealed to most, while its, while its history places the United States on the precipice of becoming a major world power, this is a series that can provide years of satisfying exploration and collecting. And I could not agree more, my friends. I cannot agree more because this is just an absolutely gorgeous and beautiful coin. I love it. And this is my first one, and I hope that in the future I'm able to acquire more of these trade dollars, maybe ones that aren't so chopped up as much, and maybe I can get some of each of the years I don't think I'll be able to get, you know, in whatever condition I can find. But this is an 1876. It's actually, you know, you know, all the words are very clear and and you can see them all nice, nicely. The only problem is, is that the eagle is so chop marked up that you can't even, and then you can't even see that the S. I don't know. Let's see if you can see it. I had to use a loop to see the S on the bottom of this. It's right, uh, it's right there. You see that line just cuts right through the S. But under a loop, you can tell that that's an S. So. So that is it, my friends. This is the, the history of the trade dollar. I hope you enjoyed it. This is a very, very cool, unique piece of American history. And I hope that uh, in the future, some of you can show me pictures of your trade dollars if you have any. I think, uh, who was it, Silver Seeker just uh, did a video where he showed off his uh, his trade dollar. So that would be cool. So check out his old last video. He showed off one that was pretty nice. I think it was in 1877. But anyway, that's all I got for you today. I hope you enjoyed History Mondays. I hope you have a wonderful week ahead. And I will see you on Wednesday for the live stream where we're going to go ahead and we're going to break down one of the, one of the two bags that uh, my father brought me. So there's a whole bunch of coins in this bag and there's a whole bunch of coins in this bag. So I think we're going to have fun searching through. We'll do one bag per, per week on the live stream. So uh, I look forward to doing that with all of you. And I think it'll be a lot of fun. So with that, you all have a wonderful week. And I will see you on Wednesday. Aloha and mahalo.